So I was asked to come out here and talk about some of the things that we do at the center, uh, more specifically, uh, some of the work that we're doing on sediment budgets. So what I'll do first off is we'll start with a talk outline. We'll talk about what we're just spend about five or ten minutes talking about basic coastal processes, right? So we're all on the same page, how sand moves along the beach. Uh, we'll talk about engineering structures because it's hard to talk about coastal processes without talking about engineering structures. They are very prevalent. Then we'll get into the meat of it, talk about sediment budgets, what they are, how they work, and what you do with them, which is you create a regional sediment management plan, right? Sand moves, does not move along arbitrary boundaries, right? It just moves. So if you come across a town line, sand keeps moving, right? If it goes into one, harbor comes out the other, that kind of thing. So we're moving toward now as a state, um, regional sediment management plans, and the sediment budget is a way which you could base that, base that on. So we start with waves. Waves run the show, right? No waves, no erosion for the most part. Uh, storms, things like that. And it's, it's, it's important to remember what we're talking about when we're at the coast. So a cubic meter of seawater, which is about the standard size of a stove, right, weighs one metric ton. So there's a lot of mass at the coast, right? There's a lot of energy at the coast. On average, on, a, on a, an Atlantic beach shoreline, a wave will hit the beach every six seconds. So it's a lot of mass, it's a lot of waves. And you start doing that math, 600 waves every single hour, 14,000 a day, 5 million a year. Right? It's the reason why open ocean sandy beaches are some of the most dynamic environments on the planet, because the waves are continually changing them. Now, if you go to the beach uh, for two weeks in August every year, it's going to seem pretty similar. Right? It's going to look the same. Uh, if you go year round, you can see that change. And that's really important for you guys who are here all year round or just off the coast all year round. It's incredibly, incredibly dynamic. So how does sand basically move along the beach? There's two different ways. There's uh, a longshore sediment transport and cross-shore sediment transport, right? So we'll, we'll do longshore first. And this is the best way to illustrate this is you're sitting on the beach, you're on your towel, and you walk straight out into the water. And you're in the water for 15, 20, 30 minutes. And then when you walk straight out of the water, your towel's over there, right? So what happens is this has to do with the wave approach. Very rarely um, do waves approach perfectly parallel to the shore. They almost always approach at an angle, right? That's how surfers can surf, right? They surf down a wave. When you're sitting on that beach and you're sitting on your towel and you look out at the wave, you can kind of follow the wave as it breaks, right? So when you're out there and you've been moved, what happens is every time a wave comes in, it picks you up a little and it puts you down a little further down the beach. And it picks you up and it puts you down. It's doing the same thing as the sand, right? It's constantly moving. It's constantly moving that sand. Now, in the summertime, it's much lower energy. In the wintertime, it's much more energetic. But that's the, the principle you have to keep in your mind when we talk about this. And they actually call this the river of sand, right? That's the way, a good way of thinking about it. It's zig zigzagging up the beach, down, up and down, up and down. But it moves right along the coast. So it's really important to remember that. Now, how much are we talking about, right? We talked about waves. How much sand? Again, on average, on an open ocean beach in the Atlantic Ocean, you get about 400 to 500,000 cubic yards of sand moving every year. And that's along the entire nearshore area. Not just the beach. It's the beach all the way out to about 30 feet. Right? So there's always sand moving. This is a lot of material. So we'll do the same thing we did for waves. That's 1,000, 1,500 cubic yards every single day. That's 100 to 150 dump trucks of sand every single day, on average. Again, a lot more in the winter, a lot less in the summer. That's a dump truck every 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. Now, in some places, again, this is an average, 400, 500,000. It can be a lot more. In the outer beaches of Cape Cod, it's almost double that, right? And obviously, in other places, it's less. But this gives you a sense of how dynamic these areas are. Sometimes it'll too dynamic to be messing around on the beaches. <laughs> but again, that's longshore sediment transport. Now, we have erosion control structures when we have problems with erosion. I like to call them erosion relocation structures, <laughs> right? We're not controlling the erosion. We're moving it somewhere else. That energy, that wave energy, that's causing the erosion has to go somewhere else, right? It has to do something. That energy is in motion, and it's going to do something. So we're going to look at all four of these. Well, we're going to look at three of these. We're going to look at the groins, jetties. We're not going to talk too much about breakwaters, and then we'll talk about seawalls, right? So a groin is just a, sh a shore normal, a perpendicular structure to the shoreline, and it could be made of almost anything. But what it does is, again, we have this river of sand. It's going to capture sand updrift, and it's going to erode sand downdrift, right? So we'll use that term, upstream, downstream, like a river, but we say updrift and downdrift. So if the sand's going from left to right, that's updrift, that's downdrift. If you own this house, the groin's not working for you, right? You own this house, you're all set. 
And now when we talk about a river of sand, that looks like a dam, right? That literally looks like a dam that's full. Now, which way is the sand moving? It's going to be quizzes throughout. Yeah, you're all, you've got this. Yeah. So the sand's moving from right to left, right? The sand's moving along the sea. Look at where the waves are breaking. Here and here. There's a big offset in the shoreline because there's so much sand accreting, right? Updrift. There's so much erosion downdrift. So we go back to this one. If you have that one groin, you have a house right here, you build another groin. This is what has to, almost has to happen. You have, like again, this is working here. You have this house. You're going to build one here. Now your house is good. But guess what happens? Somebody's got a house right there. So you have a groin field, right? This is the North Shore, one of the North Shores of Nantucket. So we're seeing it out here. You see it almost everywhere. Now, which way is the sand going in this picture? It's a little trickier. Look at the waves. Yeah, right? Left to right. It's going this way. You can't see too much on the beach, right? There's not that much of an offset, but these waves are telling you it's going that way. Now, these pictures are snapshots. If the wind starts coming out of the northeast, sand's going to go the other way for a little while. It's, what we're most interested in is the net sediment transport. Right? It's going to go, depending on where the waves are coming from that particular day, it's going to be going in that direction. But overall, over a course of a year, what's the net sediment transport? All right, you guys already got that. Talk about jetties. You all know about jetties. Jetties are built for one purpose and one purpose only, to keep the channel open. Right? We don't care if there's erosion or accretion on either side of the jetty. That's fine. We just want to keep the channel open. Right? Doesn't always work. Sometimes you've got to dredge it every once in a while. But that's what jetties do, and that's what they're built to do. Uh, and you need them. You can't not have them. Right? Uh, those are pretty simple, and they're just like they're groins, but they're on either side of a, a, a navigation channel. And then you have seawalls. Now, seawalls is a generic term. There's all kinds of er, er, structures that out there. Seawall is just a vertical structure. It could be cement. It could be a revetment. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, riprap revetment, which is kind of sloped. It could be wood. It could be bulkheads. All that kind of stuff. Um, so that's depending on what you're talking about. But what's really interesting, in the 1980s, now this is really settled, talk about settled science. In the mid to late 80s, there was a seminal article called Seawalls versus Beaches. That was the title. One or the other. You got to choose, right? If you have an eroding beach and you put a seawall on it, you're going to get more erosion. Now, it's not going to move landward because you put a wall there. These erosion control structures work, right? They don't not work. We put them in because they work, right? Anything behind the seawall is going to be protected as long as that seawall is uh, intact. But that wave energy that's moving all that sand around is still going somewhere. So there's choices that, that communities make, that we make, about what you want here. Now, this is a, a beach at, you know, at high tide. You don't have much beach. So what happens with the seawall? This is from the 1938 hurricane. I love this picture. This is just a wall hitting the beach in Providence, right? I mean, hitting the wall in Providence. There's a lot of wave energy going up. But if it's going up, it's going sideways and it's going down, right? This wave goes in all these different directions. And what happens is the bottom of the seawall gets scooped out, right? That wave energy is going to pull sand off a beach, just like during a storm. And it's going to undermine that seawall over time. It happens all the time. Right now in the wintertime, there's a storm coming up this, this uh, weekend. It's going to be a minor one, nor'easter. They're already talking about situate and Mansfield and those areas where the seawalls are pretty precarious, right? Because they're getting undermined. Um, and yeah, they get people wet. They scare people. You got to be careful. Um, but these seawalls, again, you've locked it in place. Everything else is moving. Everything else is dynamic. But you've locked the shoreline in place when you build these things. They can't move now. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. I took this picture uh, when I was working for the, I was get, finishing my PhD. Wow, it was 2005. Yeesh. This is in Plymouth. I love this picture because it shows three different things. There's, there's a, a revetment here, nicely vegetated bluff. No revetment here. We were out here in the site visit because this property owner wanted to build a revetment, right? And there's your public beach. But look at the three states of this bluff. This one's nice, right? It's nice and vegetated, and, and it's, all, it's all good right here. This one has not had this. They try to plant grass and vegetation, and it's not as bad as this one. So you have these three states of coastal bluff right next to each other based on what the structures are doing. So it's a really interesting picture, and it shows you really side by side what's going on. The problem becomes, again, if you look at when we were out here, you could tell the elevation of the beach was different in different places. The elevation of the beach was a little higher here and a little lower here because of that effect, where the sand just keeps, if a, if a, sand, if a wave hits, if a long linear wave hits right here, it's going to pull sand off of here, a little less sand here, and it's going to pull sand from in front of the structure. 
right? That's what it has to do. So we have what we call end effects. Again, we're in Nantucket here. So what happens? End effects. You build a structure, the waves are still coming into this area, right? The waves, you build a structure, it just gets around it eventually. You have to keep building it. Once you build it, the waves are going to find where that edge is unless you wall the whole island off. The moment that structure stops, that's where that wave energy is going to get focused because this is just, if a wave hits right here, you're fine. If the structure's fine, you're fine. What's going to happen is it's going to start eroding here and that's what's happening. It's getting undermined and it wants to go right around it, right? Okay, so that was longshore sediment transport with a little bit of structure. Now we'll switch over to cross-shore sediment transport. This is when we were talking about that seasonality of beaches. You go to a beach in the summertime, you go to the beach in the winter, two different beaches. But then you come back in the summer and it looks the same, right? So this is a normal situation. Sand goes off the beach and it goes back on the beach. During a storm, you have all these waves coming in. All the water comes in. Now this water that's just hit the beach has to get off the beach because another wave is coming in, right? So that water goes down and it goes, has to go back out. There's a severe undertow if you're ever in the water during a storm. Right? And it just pulls the water back out because more water's coming in. Right? So it takes sand with it. But it can only take it out so far. And what you'll see is a bar will start to build up. And this is really cool. You don't want to anthropomorphize a beach. Right? It doesn't behave, which is about what I'm going to do right now. It's as if the beach is protecting itself. Because as the sand gets pulled off the beach in this bar, builds up, waves break. The waves break on that bar. So less energy gets to the beach, so less erosion happens. So when you have a natural beach that's allowed to erode, this bar will build up and less wave energy will get to the beach so less erosion will happen, right? That's why, that's one of the reasons why we're, we're, we're careful when we put in structures. It's really hard to put in a structure in Massachusetts because once they go in, they change the way the beach works now. It's not a natural beach anymore. Um, in chemistry, there's a term called equilibrium, right? You put, uh, you put cold milk and hot coffee. And after a, little bit, after a little bit, both those things are the same, right? Same temperature. They mix up. There's equilibrium. They reach an equilibrium after a while, and then they're going to stay that temperature more or less. Well, in coastal geology, we have a term we call dynamic equilibrium, right? And this is what we're talking about. This is the beach where the same exact beach will get really, really low and flat in the winter, and then get really, really nice and high and wide in the summer, right? Dynamic equilibrium. It comes and it goes. Sand goes off, sand comes back. That's what's supposed to happen, right? This is a classic picture from a textbook. Uh, this is California, I think it's either California or Oregon. This is the winter, that's the summer, right? Same beach, perfectly natural. We let the sand erode, and then we let the sand come back. This is good, right? Um, all right, so when I was doing my PhD in 2005, I went into a, a grocery store uh, back when they had these things in stores, and I saw this picture, right? And I just started to laugh because th this is a person, a realtor, has put this on the front page, and they have that little arrow here, right? As if to say, it's this house. Don't look at this one. <laughs> Don't look at that one. Look at this one. So this tells me they didn't think it was a problem to have this on the front page. They didn't think that would dissuade the owner from buying the house right next to him. The guy next to you is hanging over the bluff. Do you want to buy this house now? So I think this is the problem, is that we don't see this as a problem. We see this as just, you know, this is OK. This is what you're going to have to go through. So if this was sort of a, a, an enlightened realtor who said, you know what, that's the natural process. That's just the way it goes, then I'm OK with that. I have a sense that's not what's going on. I have a sense that they just didn't think it was going to dissuade anybody from buying it. All right. This web page I love. This is Google and time-lapse photography. Google has set this up so you can go and look from 1984 all the way to 2016, and you can cycle through these things. And for coastal geologists, man, they can read my emails if I get this stuff, right? This is good, good stuff. Look at all, look at how dynamic. We're looking at Madigan, obviously the western part of the island. Look at all the sand moving around. This is one picture every year from 1984 to 2016. And you can go all throughout the island and look at this stuff. It's phenomenal to look at where this this area right in here. Sand's moving in this direction, right? Look at that. Sand's moving in that direction. What's going on over here? Sand's moving in this direction. Uh-oh. What's happening in the middle? You've got, you don't have sand coming in, right? This person has sand coming in from the left. This person has sand coming in from the right. 
Remember those structures I showed you there? Yeah. Guess where they are? It's what we call a nodal point. It's where sand is moving in different directions, right? Sand is going, the net direction of sand is going in one direction and the other. And I can look at this stuff all day. This I just zoomed into because you get more information here. There's a lot going on here. This island is actually changing orientation a little. Right? It's kind of like this when it starts, and now it's kind of like that at the end. Right? Really, really dynamic stuff. Uh, the south coast here, very, very funky right here. This is a lot of change, folks. There's a lot of change right in here. It's fluctuating. Right? It's fluctuating. Again, you can look at this stuff all day. So just Google time lapse in Google. You can go anywhere in the world. It's really cool. When I teach classes, we spend all kinds of time on this because it's really fun to see how this stuff changes. Um, and the last one, the, the only one of the coastal processes I didn't talk about is overwash, right? So when there's a storm, all the sand will come in and fill the low-lying areas. I want you to watch when it starts back up, watch right here and just right in the mid 90s it's going to go boom. Bang. See that? Watch it again. It's going to come in again right in here. Just going to go poof. Right around now. Bang. See that? All one big storm washed all that sand over the island. It's probably the perfect storm, right? That was the big one out here. So it washes it over. Is that good or bad? Ooh, moral judgment. And eh, it's not good or bad, right? It's a, it's a natural process, but it really helps the resource because this, these low lying areas are now a little higher. It just got buried in a little bit of sand, right? So if every big storm, these areas are allowed to overwash, and that material is allowed to stay there. It just keeps getting higher. This is one of the ways coastal environments keep pace with sea level rise, naturally. There's a storm. It's not only erosion during a storm. We think of erosion during a storm. But erosion in one place is deposition in another. Right? It's a zero-sum game. You guys live on an island. Right? This is, you have the perfect, it's what we call a littoral cell. You know where the sources are. You know where the sinks are. You guys are easy. The source is the island, and the sink is off-island, for the most part, right? All right, so I've used these terms. Now we're going to go right into the sediment budget stuff. What's a sediment budget? A sediment budget is just like a house budget. You have a certain amount coming in. You have a certain amount going out. And you hope you have more coming in than you have going out. If you don't, you have erosion. And if you do, you have accretion. And accretion can be a problem, too, right? If you want to look at the sediment budget for that navigation channel, it was positive, a little too positive, because they had to dredge it. So it's not good or bad, necessarily. Um, so we'll talk about this, we'll talk about sources and sinks, this is important. Uh, and then again, that net direction of sediment transport, that's the key. It's just it's a tricky concept, it's trickier than you think. But um, So we'll walk through it. Perfect example of a littoral cell. This is a natural cell on the outer cape, right? No structures, no dredging, uh, uh, no dredging of inlets, it's all within the Cape Cod National Seashore. So it's a very, very natural situation. And all the material, by the way, I know I talk really slowly. But if you have questions, interrupt, right? Just you got to get them in there because I'm moving on. Um, <laughs> so all the material that erodes from this area, it all ends up in Monomoy or it ends up in Provincetown. That's it. More or less a closed system. Because it's natural, because we let it erode, everything that erodes here is going to end up here or here. There's a little lo lost offshore, but not much. Right? That's always going to happen. You're, during a storm, you're going to pull it way out, and it can't get back in. So we started doing this work. Graham Guy is one of the founders of the center. Started doing this work quite a few years ago. I started in the center in 2009, and we started uh, really focusing on uh, um, sort of tackling place after place. So what we did was we started looking at different places, and we found it. So here's that nodal point, right? The, if, you, if you know anything about the Cape Cod National Seashore, they have lost stairs going down the Nosset Beach, Nosset Light Beach, and Marconi almost every year. The stairs keep getting beat up. Where are they? Uh-oh. They're in that nodal zone. They're in that area where no sand, no net sand is coming into. It's just going out of this area. So that's a problem, right? That's a problem. So we're doing sediment budgets throughout the area. We're looking at different areas. These are the sinks. That's some good PowerPoint skill right there. These are sinks. This is where the sand ends up. And of course, they end up in Wellfleet Harbor and it ends up in Barnstable Harbor. But I'm going to show you how we do this. Oh, yeah, I'll just cycle through this. Again, we've been, we've been plugging away in Cape Cod Bay for a while now. We're getting these grants uh, to do this work from different entities. And we've done the sediment budget for pretty much the entire Cape Cod Bay. We need to do this one little section left. But, the, but we've been, been doing this now for quite a while. OK, how do we do it? This is a nautical chart in Provincetown Harbor. 
This is the original data that they made the chart with. The nautical chart in Provincetown, however, has data from 1933. Hadn't changed all that much in certain areas, right? So these data were collected by a lead line. It's part of, part of the WPA project. They just put guys to work. And they went out and did these lead line surveys. And they just dropped the lead line down and they recorded it. They would set up on land and they would shoot as best as they could a boat out in a straight line and they just keep dropping the lead line. An enormous amount of data. And they were really accurate because when what we do is we create maps out of these data, right? We create the before picture. And the data, I mean, the, it's just phenomenal, the work they did and the quality. Um, this is what they did from the late 30s to the early 1950s, all WPA work. And this is the only data we have. If they did not do this, we wouldn't have data for this area. We wouldn't be able to measure change. We wouldn't be able to understand what's going on out there uh, in any sort of comprehensive way. So these data are phenomenal. And they're really, really good. I mean, I'm, we were just, when we first started doing this, we were stunned at how accurate they were. Um, but then we come to realize they knew what they were doing. Um, OK, so we did a project in Barnstable. Um, and this is really, this is just a fun story here. We get one of these old maps made from the 1930s. And one of the tricks is these data, when you look at depths, our soundings are in feet, but they're mean low water, so they're tidal. But mean low water in Nantucket is different than mean low water in Barnstable. And mean low water in Barnstable is different than mean low water in Chatham, right? So now you have to tie all these elevations in to a common datum, right? So what you have to do is you have to go out and find when they did the survey, and every time these guys did this, it created a benchmark. These are all over the place. So you have to go and shoot this benchmark, because that's, that's, that was their zero point. That's where they started. Everything was measured off of this. So we had to go back on Sandy Neck and find this benchmark and shoot it with our GPS. Then when we make our measurements for the modern day surface, then we start to understand it's apples and apples now. It's not apples and oranges. So we can compare those depths. So we actually went out. We found it. Uh, this was in 2015. Um, and then when we started looking at these maps, because they're so rich, these guys would work all day. Uh, and then they would go home at night, or go home. They'd go to the field site, and they would write up their notes. And it was incredible, the detail there. Right? So we were looking at this map, and we noticed this, bench rock. Bench is a word that surveyors wakes them up at night when they hear this word, because it's a benchmark. And they always want as many benchmarks they can get. The more benchmarks you have, the tighter your data are. So what is bench rock? So Steve McGue, one of the people who works on this project with us, he's a historical cartographer. I bet you they didn't give you that on career day in high school. right? Historical cartographer. He went and looked at what this was. The 1930s, they created a benchmark. When they first surveyed Barnstable Harbor, they did it in 1862, and they used a rock as their benchmark. And they surveyed it the day Appomattox started. So right during Civil War, on that day, they shot bench rock, and they did the whole harbor in 1860. So, and this is kind of cool too. If you go on Google Earth, bench rock's there. <laughs> but you wouldn't know what it was unless you went back into their, into their writings that they did and figure out why it's there. So this is clever, right? This is the guy with the PhD in the water up to his knees wearing jeans, surveying bench rock. <laughs> the guy with the master's degree was smart enough to bring his hip waders, and the boat captain's just high and dry and smiling at us. <laughs> I'm going to go with smiling rather than laughing, but we'll just we'll move on. But you can take care of that right, on the way home. OK, so um, we have all this data. We have all this data. I'm the director of the seafloor mapping program at the center. We make seafloor maps, right? We have this really nice data visualization software that we can turn these kinds of data into a historical surface. So we can see what the seafloor looked like in the 1930s with the mapping software that we have. So we take that and we compare it to the modern day surface and then we cut it up. I don't know if there's any students here, but calculus has a practical application. This is what we do. So we look at these two, we look at these two profiles, right? One's from 1933, this is the area here. The red is from 1933, the black is from 2010. And we look at the difference. And then you, you can calculate, if you integrate over all of these, you can see which direction the sand's going, how much is going, and a net, again, from before and after, a net picture, net change from 1933 to 2010. Now, this was erosion, and this is accretion. Now this, for me, asks, I, ask, I, wanna, I have a question now. What's happening here is the shoreline is getting less steep, right? From 1933 to 2010, it's gotten less steep. That's good, that's what you want a natural shoreline to do. If it's getting a lot of wave energy, it's just gonna flatten out, just like a beach would, right? In the beach, in this wintertime, beach is really flat. 
The summertime, it comes back, right? So this is what this is doing over time. Uh, I'm gonna get my little soapbox now, real quick. When we do beach nourishment projects, when we manage the beach, this is what we're managing. We're trying to affect the change for the whole system by putting sand right here. It's kind of goofy, right? We're not looking at the whole system. When we do these profiles, we're looking at the entire system. We go out until 30 feet or more because we want to make sure we know where the sand is moving and where it's not moving. So when we do this, too often we manage our coast like this, right? Way too often we manage it like this. All we do is look at the beach. All we're concerned about is what's going on at the beach. And then you put sand here, and I get it, right? I mean, the town of Sandwich has put hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of sand on their beach. And one good storm blows it out, right? But it's still in the system. They don't want to hear that. It's still in the system. It's still there. It's still helping. But it's not solving your problem. Because the problem is the waves and the tidal currents and the storms are still acting upon your beach. And they're acting upon the entire shoreline. Right. Okay, off the soapbox. So we can do a before and after. We can do a surface difference. This is what this stretch of, of this area looks like. Here is the red. And this is what we do is we take the 1930s data and the contemporary and we, we just subtract the two. So in areas where it's eroded, it's red. In areas where it's accreted, it's green. Remember that picture I just showed you where the, sh the shoreline is kind of getting flatter? That's because it was eroding close to the shoreline and accreting off the shoreline. So the same thing's happening here, right? Some people talk about, can we go sand mining and get sand here? That's a whole different thing. It's going to take a lot more work. But this is where the sand is going. It's just going offshore in these places. Um, you can look at these data in a lot of different ways. That's why these, this, the sediment budget is really, really powerful. You can look at them from just the individual profiles, the entire area. Um, same thing we did with sandwich. I'll show you sort of the final product, right? So we did Barnstable and Sandwich. And this is the two, 1933 surface. All those data would create this nice surface. Then we compare it to the 2010. And like I said, we cut it up and we look at it. And the final product we get, is, it's not very impressive, but it's, it's really, really useful. It's not visually impressive. Again, we go to calculus. When I see this slope, I know the shoreline is eroding. I mean, the whole, not the shoreline, sorry. The entire profile is eroding. This downward slope means it's so we color coded it for, for you know, general audience here. Uh, and then when it's going up, it's positive. So, You've got on this uh, axis how much sand is moving per year. 50,000 going that way, and 50,000, 100,000, over 160,000 uh, cubic yards of sand moving along this beach. So now we look at all the information. There's your sources, there's your sinks. That's the direction of sediment transport. This is actually where the nodal, those nodal points are, where the sand's going, right, and where it's coming from. So. This is, got a few more slides there, but the net versus gross, this is a big deal. Because what I just said here, what did I just say? Oh, well, here we go. See the zero? Am I saying that there's no sediment transport in this area? Am I saying there's no sediment transport right there? But it's eroding. How could it be? The shoreline's eroding. We know it's eroding, right? But I'm saying there's no sediment transport there. There's no net sediment transport there. That's the difference. So let's look at it. This is a really difficult concept to get, but I'm going to try to see if we can do this. So you got your beach, right? Again, you have that nodal point. Okay, sand's going in two different directions. Now, sand starts to erode. Oof, look at that. <laughs> right? Now, what happens here is we break up the coast into chunks, right? This is each, and it doesn't matter what the unit is, say it's 100 cubic meters, right? Now, as we get further away from the nodal point, it's cumulative. Now, this is an oversimplification, but all the sand that eroded is going in this direction, so it's added to this one. The sand that's eroded is added to this one. And you can see, as you get further and further away, the rate goes up, because there's more sand contributing to this area, right? Because it's eroding more. Now, so that is the gross sediment transport. It's happening everywhere, right? Ero sand's eroding. The net sediment transport changes depending on where you are, OK? Now, I'm going to show you one last one from this. Is, we just finished this one in East Ham, but I like this visualization here. So again, same kind of thing. But this is really interesting when you get into regional sediment management. The town, has, East Ham, has four public beaches that they put sand on. They put the same amount of sand on all four beaches, right? Uh, Cooksbrook Beach, uh, I'm not going to remember these names, Campground, Thumpertown, and First Encounter. 
but they have different, looking at the sediment budget that we produce for them, there's different rates of sediment transport. Now, if you put 500 cubic yards of sand, that's what they do. They get a, they get a bunch of dump trucks and they dump sand on the beach. The sand's going to go in different directions, right? The sand you put on Camp Town might not make it to Thumper Town. It might go north. So if you're going to manage these beaches, I don't know if there's any managers here, but expectations of the public is a big deal, right? If you can prepare the public based on science and say, well, this is what we think is going to happen. Now, you know, it can all go out the window, but this is our best guess. This is how much sand's moving year to year. This is the direction it's moving. And this is, you know, these are the beaches that we have. These are the four public beaches in East Ham. So these are going to be, man I think, I hope, these are going to be managed differently now that we know this information. Um, and again, just for real quick, again, that, that, that gross versus net, this is the beach. That's the, the cartoon we've done. It's eroding. That's the nodal point, and it's going in these directions. And as you can see, the further you get from the nodal point in this instance, the higher the rate gets. What is the nodal point that right? Yeah, yeah, that's just where if we measure the direction of sand, it's moving away from the nodal point. And so that same sand is moving that direction for this direction. Right. So sand right here will move in both. And this is, you know, it's a fuzzy area. It's not exactly right here, and it moves and things like that. But overall, this is the area where sand is going to disperse. It's going to go in different directions for the most part. Hmm? Why? Excellent question. There are nodal points for the only reason that sand moves along the beach is just waves and tidal currents. There's something about these areas where, again, those waves approaching the beach over time are going to just diverge, right? And that's what happens all the time. There's, just, there's something about the particular physical characteristics, and it's very unlikely these things are going to change, right, uh, in the short term, in the management time scale. Um, with sea level rise, if we get eight feet of sea level rise, things are going to change. But for the foreseeable future, what are you going to do next year? Uh, when you dredge the harbor, where do you want to put that sand? And Nantucket does a lot of that, right? They have a lot of sand they take from this place, and they're going to put it in that place. Nantucket would benefit greatly from this because half the work is done. Yes. It's an island. We know where the sand's coming from, right? I mean, it's not that hard. This is you have an entire littoral cell here, just like in the Outer Cape, uh, 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 the Outer Cape, right? It's all going either to Provincetown or Monomoy. Same thing with an island. Now I just got to figure out how much is going and what direction it's going in. Uh, oftentimes, hot spots occur at nodal points. So a nodal point has to do with sediment, the direction of sediment transport. A hot spot is just where, for whatever reason, there's an increased amount of erosion going on. Um, I don't know what that is. Which means that there's something offshore, obviously, that's maybe, yeah. maybe a huge drop in the floor. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are physical characteristics that would lead one place. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a number of different reasons why you get nodal points. Um, absolutely. And sometimes it's just sort of the accumulation of the northeast storms and the southwest summer, and then it, over time you get a point. It's, it's not like if you go to this, if you're not like, you don't stand on this beach and you go to the and you go, whoa, sand's going in two directions, right? It's just over time, the net change is that it's going in those directions. Yeah? Um, could you use your Google time lapse to do a very rough? idea where nodal points are, yeah. or is that too? Well, so yes and no. Science, no. For a talk like this, yes. I would never want to hang my hat on those, because what time of the year were the pictures taken? What tide cycle were they taken? What was going on before the pictures were taken? So yeah, for, that's why I, show, I love showing it in this, in this setting, because, ooh, this is really cool. And you can actually see it happening. Uh, to measure it is a whole different thing, right? You want to really, you want to really measure it. Yeah? Um, so I got, I got my graduate degree in North Carolina, right? In North Carolina, when they do beach replenishment projects, it's like seven figures. They will mine hundreds or millions of cubic yards of sand from offshore and put it on the beach, just like Florida, right? These guys, they do a lot of sand mining there. Um, and it's, you know, it's done, private contractors do it for the state or for the community. Massachusetts doesn't. Uh, the one, the project in Sandwich was one of the biggest projects, I think it was the biggest project ever to happen. Um, so that's for a lot of different reasons. We have a very strong fishing lobby here. So when you, anything, anytime you do beach replenishment from an area, everything's kind of dead, right? You pull all that sand out of there, you're killing everything that's there. Now, as a geologist, not knowing anything about ecology, I'll say, well, isn't it just going to grow back, whatever's there? I mean, it's not like it's going to be a hole. I mean, something's going to grow. I mean, if you want to create 
you know, if you create a vacuum in the ocean, something's going to move into it. Something's going to grow into it. But you are losing that ecosystem service, that habitat, for however long that recovery period is. Yeah. So we're not bringing sand from somewhere else to put in Massachusetts that it's Sharamas? For the most part, it's upland. For the most part, it's upland sources. You truck it in, right? Uh, there's a lot of beneficial reuse now. We're getting better at that, where we're going to dredge this area anyway. Let's put it here. We're getting much, much better at that. Again, though, that is really easy to do when you're in one municipality, right, for Nantucket. It's has a, a bank, a sand bank, offshore. They don't allow people to go get sand from that area. I can't go out there. No, no, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. Winthrop spent almost 10 years trying to get something permitted, literally 10 years. And all the science was done, spent a ton of money, and in the end, it, it didn't really happen. So it used to be cost prohibitive. It used to be, well, we just can't keep, you know, we can't get a boat and, and, and get all the sand. And now it's getting so much, expense, so much more expensive. There's only so much upland source you can get. Um, and we dredge a lot. Right? The, the state and, and the federal uh, government dredges a lot of material. And you know, the Army Corps of Engineers, by law, it's not their fault, has to get rid of the sand in as cheap a way as possible to save the taxpayers' dollars. So they will dredge East Harbor uh, in East Ham, uh, Rock Harbor in East Ham got dredged last two years ago. And about 50 or 60,000 cubic yards of it was gorgeous sand, like perfect sand. Some of it's mud, you gotta get rid of it, right? Some of it was just beautiful sand, and they had to just dump it out in the middle of Cape Cod Bay because that was the cheapest way to get rid of it. Because the permitting and the licensing and all the stuff you have to do to put sand on a beach is really cost prohibitive. So Congress just said, nope, if it's federal dollars, you're going to get rid of it as, as cheaply as you can. So that's up to three miles offshore or how far? The state water, yeah, state, our state water is three miles offshore. But I think the entirety of Cape Cod Bay is Massachusetts. It's all ours, even though it's more than three. If a private company was dredging offshore, they'd have to go outside of state waters, which is three miles. Now, again, Cape Cod Bay is, um, but, the, but the problem is, yeah, I, it's just cost prohibitive to go that far out. I mean, it's really expensive. Because what happens is you'd have to barge it in, and that takes forever. What you want to do is you want to go offshore just far enough where you're not in that area of active sediment transport, and then you bring it up to the uh, uh, vessel, and you make a slurry, and then you pipe it to the shoreline. And that's much easier, but you can't go too far offshore. Um, it's just really, really expensive. Thank you. Sure. Uh, actually, I only have a couple more slides. So yeah, so that we already talked about that, but I'm just going to show it again. This sort of doesn't get in there, and I think that's it. So perfect. <laughs> I'm done. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yeah. I can pass the mic around oh. for questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, does the Nantucket have a sand budget? A, a sediment budget. Yeah. No, they don't, but they really should. <laughs> no, they don't. We have talked to folks in the town, and they're interested. right? Like I said, we've done this for all the other towns in Cape When we do these resiliency grants, we, we did it for Sandwich and Barnstable. Right? We did it for um, East Ham and Wellfleet. We did it for all those. So we work with the towns all the time. Yeah, yeah we'd be happy to. I mean, it's 45 miles of beach, uh, shoreline you got here, so it's big. Right? Um, but yeah, it's, it's eminently doable. And with this method that we've developed, uh, it's rigorous, it's repeatable, it's, it's really based in science. Because we're coming up with the coastal resiliency plan as we speak right now, we're trying to come up. That's right, that's right. Yeah, I think for you guys, again, because you're in one, it's so hard to do regional sediment management uh, in Cape Cod Bay because there's too many towns. The idea of taking sand from Provincetown and putting it in Truro, forget it, right? But you could do that here because it's all Nantucket, right? It's all one system, so it'd be much, much easier to do here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, some of this stuff is um, intuitive. You can look at it and say, well, this place is eroding, this place is accreting, let's pick it. Some of it isn't, right? And that's why the more science you can get into it, the more likely you are. It's not foolproof, but the more likely you are you know, to, to not make mistakes, I guess. Is the that's why I keep thinking it's something offshore that we have to be looking at, not just pumping more sand. There's got to be, there's gotta be something, someone who's in love under the water. Like, like what I said before, but it means something pulling it out because there's something else out there. 
Oh, I, well, in terms of, so like think about the East Shore, right? It's really, really flat out there for a long time. It goes out forever, like two, three miles, and it's like 20, 30 feet of water. That's just the way this area evolved over time. And sand's always getting pulled off of there, off of Sconset and all there, and it's just rolling right out of there. So some of it's gonna come back because it's so shallow and some of it's moving around, but if you were to, it would be problematic to take sand from that area because then you are opening a hole and then you're gonna have stronger waves getting there. So you don't wanna do something like that, but yeah. A lot of interesting questions. Oh, I got one in the back. Yeah, um, how would the uh, Cape Towns use this information for policy making? So, okay, let me think. So now Provincetown, what, what we're finding is that the uh, regulatory agencies like this work because uh, the Provincetown Harbor Master, um, who we worked pretty closely with when we did the Provincetown Sediment Budget, uh, Rex McKenzie is a great guy. He kind of knew where the sand was coming from, where it was going. He's been there for 20 years. He kind of gets it. If he goes to CZM or GEP or, uh, and says, I want to take sand here and put it here, they're going to laugh and go, oh, that's great. If he comes with a sediment budget and say, I want to put sand here and put it there, now they start to say, oh, okay, you've done the work, you've done the science. Now this plan makes sense. Now, uh, for better or for worse, the, the planning agencies like to see the science. They like to see planning based in science, right? So. Provincetown used it for a couple of reasons. One, to, to try and move forward their dredging plan, to grab it from here and put it there. Also, uh, to get uh, an area where they knew it was erosional. Okay, if you're not gonna let us dredge here, let us build a dune here to protect that area, right? There's an erosional area, it's a low-lying beach. Based on the sediment budget work we did for them, it was an area of erosion, right? There was a nodal point. Uh, and they said, can we do it? And they got funded, right? In part, not because of us, but in part because they had that research to say, this is an erosional area, it's, it's a hot spot, we're gonna have a problem here, can we now do that? So they use it in a couple different ways, to help get other grants and to um, figure out where best to you know, use those dollars, basically, if that answers your question. And I think hopefully East Ham, they just got these results, will we'll, you know, do things like that, we'll plan it out a little better, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of work that has to be done before you do beach replenishment. Uh, and you have to have similar or slightly greater grain size when you're doing these projects. Um, in the 50s, and I'm not picking on the core, but in the 1940s and 50s when we were just figuring this out, the core would dredge uh, a, a, a basin. And it was really, really fine grade material and they put it on an open ocean beach. The tide would take it out. Forget about a storm. The tide would just pick it up and move it. So when you put grain size sediment on a beach, it has to be precisely matched to, you know, the source has to match where the, where the sand is going. Does that answer your question? Yeah, they're using a lot of um, building sand dumping over the, there's con So there's grain size and there's composition, right? Because it's made out of different things. So it's not necessarily all nice quartz, you know, sandy beach. It can be different material. So. Yeah, so there is, um, there is a school of thought that says you want to put a little coarser grain size on a beach because it's going to take more wave energy to move it. I think it's a dangerous game because again, you're, 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 you're trying to affect the beach or the entire coastal system by changing this. That doesn't make any sense because all the waves that are coming here to this beach are still gonna get right here. And the sand that's on here, if it's a little coarser, first of all, the beach is gonna behave differently because that's not the sand that was put there by the waves. Uh, and secondly, you're changing the nature of the beach. So it's, it's very, very tricky. It feels good to put coarser sand there, right? For a lot of people, if, ooh, let's get something a little bigger. Right? But it's not always the best thing because you're changing that dynamic equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, some of us are looking at the, kind of the best way economically to manage you know, the entire coast of the island. Sure. And so, and I just want to be sure I, I'm <coughs> getting this right. Mm -hmm. No points obviously seem to be really, really critical. And in order to figure those out, we need to do a sediment budget. Yes. And then you'll find out where all the nodal points, mm -hmm. and then you can make informed decisions about where you want to try and fight Mother Nature and where and how and right. where. You know, that's it. And it, that's it in a nutshell. Idea and what have you. So is that, that's really. That's perfect. Key. Yep, that's a perfect way of saying it. Yes. Yeah, they shift a little. What's really interesting, so that one on the Outer Cape, this is really kind of fascinating, but so the one on the Outer Cape that's sort of by Wellfleet, uh, there's a big study done by Graham guys um, 
that looked at long-term changes because uh, he's, he's shown, and it's in the literature, that the nodal point used to be further north and is starting to come south, which is really bad news for the group, for the people to the south. And what's happened is, what he thinks is, George's Bank, 6,000 years ago, 5,000, 3,000, 2,000 years ago, used to be emergent, right? It used to be out of the water. So no waves are coming out of the southeast going over George's Bank and hitting the Outer Cape. Now, with sea level rise, George's Bank is about 20 feet underwater, right? And so more and less some other places. So now a lot more southeast waves are hitting the Outer Beach, pushing more sand to the north, moving that nodal point this way. So in rare cases, yes, they do change. But that's the longer term. That's hundreds of years. And that's fascinating, though, stuff. Hundreds and hundreds. That, yeah, it's more like thousands. Yeah, it's a, it's a long term process. Oh, you still? Right, we'll get it to you next. I'm sorry. No, no, you're, no, no. Who does the oversight of making sure someone isn't climbing the sand or um, the sand that's being bought to put down various areas? Who's checking that out? Is it the state or federal or both towns? Conservation Commission is the first line of defense, right? Every, every permit that's done uh, in a wetland, in a Massachusetts derived wetland, and a beach is one of those wetlands, has to get uh, um, approval by the town's Conservation Commission. So they start first. If someone um, says, I don't like this, then it gets bumped up to the state level, to DEP, right? To Department of Environmental Protection. So the Conservation Commission, it's really important who's on your Conservation Commission. I've seen Conservation Commissions evolve over time in different towns and swing to either side of the political spectrum and different things start to happen. Conservation Commission is really, really important. Um, uh, so th there, the, again, you, the, you start there and then it can go up to the state. The federal agencies don't really get involved unless it's a you know, major deal. And as, as for who is making sure, uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done to do beach replenishment. If you're going to take offshore stuff or even up, uh, um, upland sources, there's a lot of permitting that has to be done, analysis of this material and all that stuff, and hopefully it, it works and it fits and it, you know, it's compatible. We had a question in the front row and she's been patiently waiting. Oh, yeah. uh, I can hear you. Very little. Um, the, the Army Corps of Engineers is involved in, in dredging navigation channels, right? That's their biggest thing. The federal government doesn't usually get involved in beach replenishment projects. It's a very, very local thing. If there's a big enough beach replenishment project and it's a federally, uh, what's the word? You can go through FEMA uh, and you have to develop some kind of management document. I'm not a manager. Some kind of management document. Uh, and then if there's a, a federally declared emergency or storm, you can get money to help replenish that beach. Um, but your local people would have a better answer for you there. But there is a way to get federal money. It's, it's convoluted, uh, and it's tricky, and it takes a long time. But, yeah. yeah, I was thinking of a pond. Um, oh, yeah. Many times in the Flow Mile is really interesting because uh, the, um, well, yeah, the, the state has gotten behind that and said, let's innovate. Let's try new things. And the problem is um, we're really good at building these structures. Right? These erosion control structures, seawalls, all these different funky things they do. But they all do the same thing. They prevent erosion from happening in one place and they create it in another. And if you want to really uh, uh, hurt a coastal engineer's brain, you tell them the better you build this, the worse it is. The better an erosion control structure works, the worse the impact is on the resource. Right? If you could somehow stop erosion everywhere, that wouldn't be good. Right? Because then you're stopping accretion everywhere. Um, so that's the innovation thing is very, very tricky, you know, because we know how to do this, right? There's, it's tricky, and it's politically sensitive. And I'm being recorded, so. I like your redefinition of erosion controls and erosion measures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and speaking of erosion location measures, there have been, it was an idea once to sink ships off of Nantucket, yeah. far out, right, right. so that you would relocate the erosion to the areas. Right. Is, there, is that an idea that's ever been explored or used? Oh, or? yeah, offshore reefs. Offshore reefs are pretty popular. Uh, they're like the, the one erosion control structure I didn't handle was breakwaters. And that's the, that's the basic idea of putting something offshore so it cuts down the wave energy. Um, and those, those are very prevalent. And they have negative impacts and positive impacts, right? It's, it's a balance. If you were to sink ships out there, um, all other things aside, you're going to attenuate wave energy and you're going to have deposition behind those areas. But again, 
uh, because you're blocking the wave energy and you have deposition behind those areas, that sand was going to go somewhere else. Right? So the minute you have accretion, you're stopping the, the accretion that was going to happen here. If you're, you're causing it to happen here, well, it's not going to happen there now. Right? So you're changing the way that system is behaving when you do these manipulations. And it's not, a, it's not an ethical, moral right or wrong. It's just that you're going to have impacts. And unintended consequences are very common. Oh no, you're disappearing. No, you're disappearing. You're definitely disappearing. But it's going offshore. Right? You guys are losing it offshore. So when I said you're an entire littoral cell, you have an island uh, and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but it's not going to the vineyard. Right? It's not going to Hyannis. It's not going somewhere else. It's just slowly eroding at the ends in that, that, that layer of sand. There's a reason why you have so much sand out on that eastern shore and it's so shallow. Odds are all that sand came from the island and it just kept, keeps washing out and washing out and washing out. And your island's moving to the west and leaving that sand behind as it moves. I think this, yeah, I think so. But no, you're definitely losing sand. The island is. It's going subtitle, but you're losing it. You guys are great. This is fantastic. Will your concepts um, apply to inside the harbor? You can do it. The, the, it was built for more uh, energetic open ocean uh, kind of thing. You get into a funky situation where, uh, again, this is all based on sinks and sources. And the harbor pretty much is a sink, right? It's all kind of going there. There's not much sand leaving the harbor. So when we did like Wellfleet Harbor and Barnstable Harbor, we, tr we pretty much treat those areas as if it's a sort of one way street, right? It's all going in. Now, you can sort of do it on a micro level because there are other places in the harbor where uh, there's deposition and erosion. And we did that for Provincetown Harbor because it was so active. So you absolutely could. Um, it's just, you know, it's more detailed. It's more, more finer grained, right? We would space the profiles 150 meters apart on the outer beach. In the harbor, we'd probably space them 50 meters apart or even closer because you're looking at a much more finer scale of change. So you could, yeah. I don't really like um, I was um, wondering, um, big storm events, um, I'm sure they affect the, um, the sediment budget in a lot of ways, but one of the ways um, I would think that it would change the whole like, shoal system, big storms, like, you know, like the storm of 30, right. eight, eight, you know, the big, mm -hmm. big storms, sure. 54, perfect storm. Uh, and is there any documentation, or have you had any um, science that says that those <coughs> events create movements of these, um, the hot spots are the, um, are the nodes. Because that yeah. would seem to me, I, you know, seems like those events could actually, you could see a node move in a short period of time. Hot spots definitely change, right? If hot spots didn't change, then you'd have this happening, right? If there was an, always a hot spot here, which is a road, a road, a road, and you have a hole, right? So they do move around from time to time. They, they have to, or else you can't always have erosion in one place. So they definitely move around. So we know that. Um, and storms definitely, uh, if you were to take a map uh, uh, right before a storm, again, off the east shore, we have all these nice dunes, underwater dunes. It would all flatten out after a storm. But then, in fair weather waves, it would all move back onshore, right? Just like the beach does seasonally, moves on and offshore. Those things, will, the, the wave action over a long period of time is pretty, you know, stable, right? It's pretty, it's pretty uh, there's a dynamic equilibrium there. So those, those things, those features will build back up over time. So, yeah, the, the storms do a lot of work for you. Um, but you'll lose sand to the system because after a while, when the storm pulls sand out so deep, it can't come back anymore, right? So that's what storms do over a long period of time. They just keep moving it out, keep moving it out. Then some of it moves back in, but some of it just goes too far out and it can't get back. Have you ever, have you ever seen an area where it's, um, say, there's a dune, yep. and then there's wetlands mm -hmm. and Yep. And have you ever seen where the sand is now created over the dune? Oh, sure. It's yeah. Right yeah, that's not uncommon. That, that's, that's what happens. You have these, you know, if you go to the beach, the wind's almost always in your face, right? And you have all these, and you have prevailing winds, right? The wind's always out of the south, well, it's usually out of the southwest uh, in, in the summer, northeast in the winter, and those are prevailing winds, or northwest in the winter. Um, so the dunes line up that way, and then they're going to migrate a certain way. So some dune systems migrate landward, and they just march right over whatever's in their way over time. So yeah, that, that's common. It's a lot of sand out there, a lot of sand. All right, let's give Mark a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.